We've now got, um, funnily enough, and this is a complete um, coincidence, an old friend of mine, uh, Brian Baglow from the Scottish Games Network, who's going to talk to us um, about a career in esports and to, from a play and a production and performance perspective. I think the first thing to say about Scotland um, with respect to video games is Scotland's a real powerhouse uh, and always has been, um, both sort of culturally and commercially. Uh, in terms of video games creation. Some of you may uh, be old enough to remember Lemmings, um, like a, a company called DNA, amazing game from the sort of mid-90s, 16-bit um, game. And most of you will know Minecraft, um, which although not absolutely you know, developed in Scotland from the beginning, uh, a lot of it um, was produced in Scotland uh, soon after the game was invented. Um, so that's that's amazing, and then probably the biggest game on the planet ever is Grand Theft Auto, and that game is made mainly in Scotland, but also in Leeds. Um, most people don't realise that you know Lemmings and Grand Theft Auto and huge parts of Minecraft are Scottish, so they should, and they hopefully will now. Um, but Brian's going to talk to us really about where we go for you know how, how we take that forward. Um, from a community perspective and from kind of the perspective of industry and the creativity. So look, enough of me. Brian, welcome. Do your thing. Thank you very much, Andy. And uh, thank you very much for spoiling the first four slides of my presentation, man. Come on. I was going to set the scene, but uh, no, it's all good. It's all good. So Mike and I have been talking and uh, we're going to do this in a bit of a one-two punch. I'm going to take you through the games ecosystem in Scotland right now and uh, where we are, sort of the strengths, where Scotland really is, um, still punching. And then Mike's going to take you into a lot of the roles, a lot of the, the um, areas in esports where we can build upon what we already have. Moving swiftly on, to, to recap what Andy very thoughtfully um, took you through, a lot of people were aware that Scotland has got such a strong heritage and such a, a, a really... A proud legacy when it comes to video games. We'll be back. Lemmings just celebrated its 30th anniversary. Uh, one of the first real, you know, international superstar hits. You know, the game was ported to over 25 different platforms. Um, now owned by Sony, it's still out there. It's still being developed uh, currently for mobile. Grand Theft Auto from the same company, DMA, uh, initially released in 1997. That was my first entry point into the video game sector. I was the writer on Grand Theft Auto, so I got to do a lot of swearing um, for my first job in the games industry, and that really hasn't changed. But uh, out of uh, DMA Design, we got Real Time Worlds, the creators of Crackdown, and uh, obviously APB, which didn't necessarily do quite so well, but the ambition was admirable. And again, as Andy said, Minecraft, all of the console editions are created here in Scotland by 4J. And we've got an awful lot of new companies coming through. Uh, no Code, who are based in Glasgow, uh, are the creators of a game called Observation, which has won more BAFTAs than James McAvoy. They had to move offices just to give themselves shelf space for all the awards for that game. And uh, more recently, Monstrum 2, the sequel to the procedurally generated asymmet asymmetric survival horror game um, from Junkfish in Dundee, was voted the game of the show, um, the UK game of the show, uh, for Gamescom in 2020 so we've got it going on guys we have we've got so much happening um but outside the big studios we don't tend to get a lot of recognition there's not a lot of spotlight people aren't aware of just what's going on so over the last year i've actually been doing some research i've been going out and mapping the whole of the games ecosystem not just the industry not just the developers but really looking at every area of gaming in scotland including esports and this is due to be delivered at the end of the month. So you guys are getting an exclusive in this. Um, and the good news is that Scotland remains an amazing place to be if you want to get involved in video games and indeed esports. 
On the educational side of things, seven universities are now producing games graduates. 11 colleges across the country are producing games uh, students with HNCs and HNDs. We've got two innovation centres with InGame in Dundee and Creative Informatics in Edinburgh. And the number of people out there uh, engaged in game studies uh, through Aberty, obviously, but also Glasgow University, they're pioneering in a lot of areas and um, when it comes to the academic research going on into games. And a lot of this is focused around esports and competitive and professional playing. So it's a fantastically rich and varied environment if you want to study games and make it your livelihood. Then when it comes to the industry, and um, believe it or not, and this took me by surprise, we've got over 300 active games companies across the country. Now, the vast majority are one-man operations, one-man bands. They can be part-time gigs, side hustles, or people going out and building their own games. You know, uh, Nick from Edinburgh College um, is an active game developer when he's not actually, you know, shaking the silverware at the camera or leading his team to victory. Um, and there's an awful lot of people out there who, over the course of the, the pandemic and the lockdowns, have decided to take their passion for gaming and turn it into something new. But... Um, within that 317, we've got probably about 60 to 70 major studios um, and what you could classify as employers. Now, that was a surprise. But then when you look around that, we've got 74 supporting companies, companies who are providing services to the game sector across audio, marketing, animation, in pretty much every area you can think of who are actively involved in, in helping people make games, helping get games onto the market. Um, and one of the big areas of growth for Scotland is games tech. We've got an awful lot of companies out there who are looking at data, they're looking at live ops, facial capture, artificial intelligence. Um, I was asked to do a, a, a big piece, a case study for AI and games for the launch of Scotland's AI strategy at the beginning of this week. And so the government is starting to recognise that video games has far more to offer than car theft and shooting people in the face. So again, it's just a fantastically rich and vibrant area. And everybody kind of knows that Dundee is the beating heart of video games. And it remains so. You know, most of the big developers are, are located in and around the Dundee cluster. But Dundee doesn't have it all its own way anymore. Games are spreading out across the whole of the country. Um, I did this little map uh, last night. Um, and as you can see, pretty much all of the major cities and a lot of the regions around the, the, um, the country are really starting to pick up. You know, I had to include Fife. I'm a Fife boy, very proud of it. 16 games companies there. You know, way back in the uh, very early 2000s, we had one of the world's first mobile games companies, Digital Bridges in Dundee, and it's still continuing to produce um, colleges, produce, uh, excuse me, produce new startups through colleges and through um, the, the courses that are available out there. So, you know, you guys in the right place. And when it comes to roles, to kind of give you a bit of context, it used to be that the idea was that you had to be a programmer, you had to be an artist. And OK, those are still core roles, but there's so much more out there. You know, you've got production management, QA and test. There's a growing number of people out there who are now helping to promote and support games and get them out. You know, if you can't acquire your users, then how are you going to make money out of them? And then alongside community, you know, these are kind of, again, traditional roles, if you want to look at it that way. But these are now being supplemented by a whole new range of roles and vacancies and positions that are tying a lot more closely into uh, esports. Whole live ops is becoming more and more relevant. So how do you run a live video game, whether it's an MMO? whether it's a multiplayer battle arena, whether it's it's a, a live sports game like um, Rocket League. An awful lot of companies looking for people who can help them engage with esports. Similarly, data analytics. You know, it's vital for a lot of these games to understand your players, to be able to monetize them and bring things through. And then user acquisition. Um, you know, again, directly relevant to the world of esports. And... A growing number of companies out there are looking for people with these skills. And when it comes to esports itself, we've got a small but growing number of organisations up here 
um, including, obviously, Mark and the British Esports Association and the fantastic work that they're doing. But homegrown talent, we've got Esports, James and the team are doing some great things. Um, Adam at ADL Gaming has just acquired, uh, has just uh, secured some funding to help grow what they're doing. Skelp, the Scottish Esports Hub, are all really starting to establish themselves and do a lot of really interesting work across the country. And then finally, having gone through this whole mapping thing, I started to take a look at streamers. Um, and I will admit, guys, I, I, I kind of tapped out at about 600. Um, we've got some serious talent here. We've got some really good people out there who are showcasing what Scotland can do in terms of um, live gaming, pro gaming and esports. Um, going from, you know, uh, Sco and the One Manny all the way up at, at uh, close on 400,000 um, Twitch subscribers, all the way down to my own humble effort, which let's say needs a little bit of, uh, well, I need to actually do something with it if I'm going to attract more subscribers. But again, what a place to be. You know, this is an incredible country. We're doing an awful lot of things. And let's be, let's be honest, within this ecosystem, there's so much more that we can achieve. And one of the catalysts could be the creation of the new Dundee Esports Arena, which is scheduled to be finished by 2024, 4,000 seats. It's already talking to the teams at Aberty and Dundee and Angus College, specifically about using the facility for educational purposes and for really helping to bring esports through into the educational side of things. So quite frankly, it's an embarrassment of riches. Um, it's an incredible place. The games industry has been here for the, the, the last few decades now. I really want to make sure that esports is a, you know, a, a viable and vibrant part of the whole gaming ecosystem moving forward. That's me. Thank you very much. I look forward to hearing your questions. Thanks, thanks, Brian. That was, thanks, uh, Brian. That, was, that, was uh, that was really brilliant. Really brilliant. Um, sorry for sorry. stealing a bit of your thunder. <laughs> um, uh, that wasn't That's deliberate. Right. I have to say, it's a genuine mistake on my, on my part. But really, really great. Interesting. Just I think from the viewer's perspective, the uh, the Dundee Esports Arena, and it kind of plays into something that um, we've been looking at British Esports for a while. Um, Football, professional football, association football, quite an important cultural part of the UK. I don't think anyone would have any, any argument with that. But it came out of the Industrial Revolution. And we're arguably in the fourth Industrial Revolution now. And I think the games industry has been a real driver of technology, applied technology in fun, entertainment, content. And it, it, it just feels to me like the whole of the, the rise of esports in parallel to video games that the two industries together, the kind of one feeds off the other. And I think we're going to see arenas being built around the games clusters in the UK pretty quickly. And I think that's good news for uh, the education sec uh, sector because education plays a massive part in this clustering, um, education and commerce being the kind of the two ends of it, really. And I think that, that, that feels like it's a really good time to be alive and to be in this sector. Um, some of us, like me and you, have been around for a long time. But I feel like this is the most energised it's been for a very long time um, because we can see you know, this last 12 months has, has given us a, uh, you know, an insight into what happens when the world shuts down and we have to rely on online. And it's just it's come through with flying colours, frankly. Um, but I don't know, you know, are you optimistic about Scotland's position right now? I am. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I, I think we've got so much to offer. We've got all of the pieces. Um, all we need to do is really join the dots. And we're a small country, so we, we absolutely should be able to. And we've already got some fantastic examples, as, as you've just mentioned. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, the stadium in Edinburgh for Hearts, Hearts Midlothian, Heart of Midlothian, um, have already created a digital innovation centre. Um, specifically so they can start to, you know, expand out and, and, and really pull in people from uh, the local community and their fan base and help teach them digital skills. And, and they're helping them to not only uh, make video games, but get jobs, you know, polish up their career and everything. It's, it's all happening and it's happening on a grassroots level, Andy. So 
You're absolutely you're absolutely right. The the clustering is already there. It's already happening. We've already got so much going on with the education side of things, further and higher education into the universities. Uh, we've just had this incredible piece of um, research, uh, the Logan Report, which was produced in Scotland at the tail end of last year, looking at how we create a more successful tech ecosystem, being accepted in full by the Scottish Government um, for 2021. They had just announced this very morning that Mark Logan is going to be leading this and it's got seven million quid in investment to build out our tech capabilities. And obviously, gaming and esports is a very, very big part of that. So I'm incredibly optimistic, you know, and I'm working really hard behind the scenes to make sure that gaming is included, to make sure that we're represented and taken seriously at, uh, at the highest levels of government. So it's, it's awesome. I mean, let's face it, if I wasn't doing this, I'd have to go out and get a real job and that would suck. Oh, on that note, um, thank you, uh, Brian, for that. That was really great. Um, talking about um, optimism, positivity, can do. Um, we're really pleased to have Mike Kent, who's the co-founder um, of Dexerto, um, who are a, a leading uh, media company within uh, within esports. And you know, just to keep it real, super local, it's it's great because they're based in Edinburgh. So, Mike. Over to you. Hi, how are you doing? Um, I'm just going to give a quick introduction to myself. So um, I've been in the esports space since about 2003 when I first realised what competitive gaming was. In 2008, I attended my first event um, where I flew down from Edinburgh. So I'm not originally from Edinburgh, but I actually moved here from Newcastle. Um, and actually at that event in 2008, um, I was a manager of a team called Team Identity because by then, um, even in a short space of time, I'd realised that I was terrible at playing, but I still wanted to be involved in esports, so I was kind of behind the scenes. Um, and that my team actually ended up winning the event, which was great, um, especially as the managers, they didn't have all the stress of playing. Um, and then I first got involved in journalism in around 2008 um, on a predecessor website where I'm on right now. Um, and I came, basically in 2015, we launched a show, um, which is now the world's largest esports and media platform so um although i am based out of edinburgh and we hope to have an edinburgh office or we'll hope to expand the edinburgh office shall i say as a sign it and um, we are actually headquartered out of london but um of the 80 plus staff we have worldwide um we actually have uh three of us based in edinburgh and a couple of more dotted around and we hope to expand the edinburgh team um as the pandemic um kind of goes away um, and we'll hopefully be able to expand the edinburgh office and um, i guess what i wanted to discuss and talk about was that um, you know, you can actually co you can actually be successful in esports um, and the gaming streamer space without having to be in a major city like London or New York or LA. You know, you can you don't have to be in one of those self perceived hubs and actually, you know, I'm kind of proof that you can be in somewhere like Edinburgh, um, which you know, obviously Scotland does have a rich gaming history, um, but I don't think anyone's going to say it's you know the number one esports hub in the world. So um, it's kind of I want to talk today a little bit about that. Um, so first off, there's a lot more to esports than just competing. Um, so everyone thinks of esports as playing and competing, and that's pretty much it. But actually, the, and when it comes to the job market and it, when it comes to people, um, you know, making a living from esports, most of the people are actually behind the scenes. Um, so. And also with that, it's not just esports in terms of competing. It's also the gaming or gaming entertainment world. So that includes stuff like streamers and um, influencers across different platforms and um, anyone that has a kind of connection originally to esports. And it also expands out even to just, you know, me, I, for example, and a couple of my friends could sit and play um, a competitive match online. You know, it doesn't always have to be top level, multi million dollar esports. Um, but um, you know, and a great example of that is um, Dr. Disrespect. He won Streamer of the Year in 2019, um, and he's not actually an esports player. Um, so I just wanted to explain some interesting statistics about esports. It kind of gives you a good perspective on um, why you can be remote in a place like Edinburgh or Abertay or Dundee or Aberdeen or wherever in Scotland um, and still be, in, you know, be able to have an influential job and you don't need to move away to in order to do it in the esports space. So um, I've got good friends over at hitmarker.net. They're kind of the leading esports and gaming um, jobs platform. And they gave me some great statistics. Out. So um, of all jobs on their platform, which includes everything from 
uh, kind of outside of esports and I suppose outside of gaming. Um, 44,000 of those jobs um, would be posted in the last year and 4,000 were, or nearly 5,000 were remote. And that's about 11%. In esports, however, there's nearly 6,000 or 5,500 jobs and the remote jobs constitute about half of that. So it kind of shows that um, you can actually work remotely in esports a lot better than just working. Um, you don't have to move in order to do that. Um, so some of the jobs that are in esports, I think people often forget. Um, we've got stuff like business development and sales, social media, marketing, editor, editorial and writing, um, executive and management, software engineering, coaching, graphic design, video editing, talent and event production. Um, so based on the data I've provided there, if you're already based in Scotland or looking to move to Scotland, there is opportunities that are more that won't require you to move. And even prior to the pandemic, I've proved, and I'm not trying to big myself up, but I've proved that you can be successful in the esports world without having that pressure of moving to London, which is something that, you know, I know that my co-founders were very keen on me doing was moving away down to London to be with them. Um, but I kind of held, held firm and I'm really glad I did because, you know, I love Scotland. It's, it's my home. Um, you know, we've got great places like Edinburgh, Glasgow, Aberdeen, all these other cities, um, and you can get connected to places around the world. So prior to the pandemic, I'd travel all around the world. I never had any issues, the fact that I was based in Scotland. Scotland is incredibly well connected, whether it be getting train, plane, whatever. So, um, and then despite a lot of the jobs being remote, um, yeah, sorry. So despite a lot of the jobs being remote, um, even after the pandemic, the universities in Scotland doing the right courses, um, they can actually make some serious esports hubs here in Scotland. Um, so, you know, especially in major cities like Edinburgh, Glasgow, even Dundee with its gaming background. Um, reason for that is, you know, compared to say London, New York, LA, it's a lot cheaper to set up a business here in Scotland. Um, it's, you know, cheaper to get office space. And obviously with so many universities that have such great education, um, you know, we can we can basically create a hub here so that when people are more in, there's less remote jobs or not less remote jobs, but people are in office offices and um, it's just a lot more opportunity. So finally on a side note of this, um, it's kind of wider to my point, but um, a place like, for example, Brian mentioned the Dundee eSports Stadium. Um, and I personally think it's a great idea. Now, eSports tournament organizers, again, don't generally decide to host an event based on the prestige or the, or the perceived prestige of a city. So um, you, it's rare that you'll find huge tournaments taking place in places like LA, New York, London, simply because the cost is incredibly high. Um, so somewhere like Dundee, creating this eSports stadium, it could actually join a number of other cities around Europe and the world, places like Katowice in Poland, um, Cluj, Napolka in um, Romania or Cologne in Germany, cities that aren't necessarily the first cities you're going to think of when it comes to, um, you know, being an esports hub, but they've become that because they've been able to provide the facilities in order to have tournament organizers come over. Because if a tournament organizer can save money in a location where they know the fans are not going to have to pay exorbitant prices for hotels and they're not going to have to pay huge prices to host an event, um, they're going to be far more likely to do that because then they can put more money into prize money or they can just be more profitable. So I think the idea that, you know, a lot of people when I post on Twitter, like, oh, why Dundee? But it's like, why not? It's close to Edinburgh. It's got great transport links. Um, it's already got a heritage there. You know, it's an up and coming city. Um, and, it, and once again, tournament organizers are very keen because it's going to be affordable in order to host event there. Um, however, when it comes to one thing I wanted to, did want to speak about today is esports in universities and courses and college courses. Um, it's somewhat of a controversial topic, but myself and a lot of other industry veterans don't believe that um, this should just be a broad esports courses. Um, and actually instead, um, what we need is people with traditional skills, like I mentioned before, accounting, business development, event planning, um, with elements of esports mixed into those. It's not just possible to teach esports as a whole, we don't believe, um, but instead, um, we want to, you know, I think it should be event specific or it should be specific to certain areas. So in order to articulate that a little bit better, I actually reached out to a few of my colleagues. Um, so one of them is Chris Marsh. He's one of the, my co-founders and one of the driving forces behind the circle, especially in the back end. Um, and he basically said, he basically said, the problem we're seeing in many sports degrees is they're incredibly broad. So the qualification you come out with doesn't really prepare you for any real jobs. 
I believe that these courses, to become viable, they should teach a useful skill, but through the lens of eSport, or you could do eSports event management. This could effectively set people up for a career in events management, because ultimately a lot of skills will be the same, but taught through their love of eSports. They'll learn all about budgeting, the procedure, logistics, coordination, and be prepared for the job market. We're just not seeing that right now, but instead eSports courses compromise in modules that almost have no real-world application. We're also seeing some courses teaching tactics and video games, which appears to me to be completely wrong approach. If you look at sport, for example, you don't go to uni to qualify to coach football. The coaching bodies run the qualifications. I also reached out to Adam Fitch, who's an award-winning journalist and part of the DeSoto team. Um, and he said, as we've seen universities in England, eSports has been introduced to the curricula inefficiently. If universities in Scotland were to weave esports into relevant subjects, they would then give students a head start on properly understanding our industry as well as others. From there, we'd have a well-equipped cohort who not only could integrate into esports, but understand how to change it for the better, should they decide it's something they're interested in. If not, they would have applicable skills elsewhere. Um, so in summary, I believe Scotland's in a fantastic position. Um, I think if universities kind of take this advice on, I'm sure they are, um, I feel really strongly about Scotland being a future hub for esports, gaming and influence entertainment, both from a jobs and education perspective. And hopefully in some way I can help develop the place that I've adopted to come home to become that. So thanks very much. Oh, Mike, that was brilliant. Um, thank you so much for that. That, that insight's great. Um, you, you hit on something that's close certainly to my heart, has been for a long time, this, this whole sense of place. Um, some of you might detect there is a London accent here. I don't live in London anymore. Um, but there's been too much emphasis on everyone having to go to places like London or LA or New York to, to, you know, to, 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 to make their businesses. That's all changed. And it's changed now, I think, positively out of the pandemic. People have realised that you don't have to schlep into one place to work, but you can work online and you can balance it. And I think that the video games industry in the UK, which you know we're very proud of, has got a number of hubs that are spectacularly distributed through, through the United Kingdom. And there's not really much logic to it outside of two things. Either a very, very hot, uh, relevant education uh, organisation. Abate is a fantastic example of that, for example. Or... There's been a business um, founders have set up. So, for example, in, in England, there's Leamington Spa, which, you know, the last thing it was known for was being sort of spa baths for the book for the Georgians. OK, now it's a massive hub, hub for uh, video games production. Why? Because Codemasters set up in that area on a farm 30 years ago. And over the years, people have worked at Codemasters, have moved on and set their own businesses up. And because of the digital revolution, that's been possible. So that's like amazing, really. I think what you're doing is, you know, hats off, even though you've got your hat on, hats off. That, um, <laughs> yeah, you don't want to see my hair. Down hair. <laughs> hats off to you, um, you know, to, to locate the business in Edinburgh. Um, there's been some questions in the chat, which I think are really, um, really interesting. Um, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's, there's a fellow sort of journalist here who's talking, he's on a, he's, uh, he says, Mike, I'm on a sports journalism course. It's incredibly difficult to get across how important esports actually are. Any advice how to combat that? Um, yeah, it's a difficult question. I think that what he needs or she needs to do is they need to um, they need to basically just find that um, esport experience through stuff like vol voluntary roles. So, for example, on Hitmarker, you can go on there and look for part time or and. Um, voluntary positions, internships. Um, and really what he needs to do is, is basically to, to learn, his, learn about eSports and what's going on through uh, and get experience doing that if he's not able to convince um, otherwise. I think the, the best way to convince people, though, is just to talk about the money. <laughs> I think if you just find top-level statistics when it comes to money um, and tournaments and be like, you know, this Dota 2 tournament had a $35 million prize pool and there's millions of people watching. The statistics everywhere. Look at news here. Look at, you know, we've posted some information on statistics before. Um, so I think there's a lot of statistics and information that you can use in order to convince someone. But ultimately, it's going to be a hard sell and you're better off just getting the experience yourself rather than trying to convince someone who's probably not going to be that interested. Okay, fair point. Um, so just for both of you, just got a couple more minutes, really. 
There's a question yeah. here um, about, it says like, as esports become more professionalized and players potentially work 24-7 to improve, do, do, do either of you worry about the balance between screen time and sort of connecting face-to-face? Absolutely, Brian, I think that? it's... Oh, oh, sorry, Mike. No, Brian. No, no. Go, yeah, go on. So, yeah, it's absolutely a problem. And actually what's happened and what we've noticed um, as uh, esports become more professional, um, they end up having, for example, the big teams and the big franchise leagues that pay millions of dollars to get involved. They started to get involved with um, nutritionists, sleep coaches, you know, um, psychologists, the whole way that you'd get with sport as well. And people kind of are slowly but surely learning that you don't actually need to play seven days a week, 14 hours a day to do that. But ultimately, that's just going to be that is just what's going to happen. People are already doing it outside of esports. People sat on their phones all day. People sat in front of computers or TVs watching Netflix. So um, I, I actually think that when it comes to esports, you know, for me personally, I used to, my mum and dad used to be really worried about me um, being online all the time when I was younger, playing on Xbox Live, um, and worried that I was just speaking to all these random people. But actually, that kind of made me who I was, made me who I am today. And, um, you know, it made me far more comfortable speaking to people in public, speaking to different types of people. You know, and I ended up meeting up with all these different people, obviously pre-pandemic, and um, you know, at all these different tournaments, and I made friendships that I can count across the world. And I don't know many people who went to my school that can kind of say they're good friends with people based literally from Australia to to LA. So I think actually esports is a great way of bringing people together. And you know, yes, there's a lot of screen time, but I think there's just a lot of screen time in general these days. Cool, Brian. Have you got anything to add to that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is one of the the best and worst things about video games. And we do engagement better than any other type of media in the world. You know, people can spend hundreds and sometimes thousands of hours playing games, you know, and unless you're a really slow reader, there's pretty much not any other, you know, type of content out there that, that can give you that kind of engagement. So on the one hand, it's a fantastic way, as Mike was just saying, to bring people together. And we've had so many examples. You know, the BBC did a documentary recently about all the benefits of gaming and the ways in which it can help players to find other people to relate to. But, you know, within our industry, um, and you've seen the issue of crunch and people working ridiculous hours. Um, And it's because it's passion driven. You know, people get into the games industry because they want to make games. People play video games because it's really good fun. So there has to be balance. And I think when you're looking at um, esports as a profession, as a career, then it introduces a whole other level of reasons for people to spend that time online. Um, and yeah, I, th- I think as a, as a sector, we need to you know, be quite proactive and say, okay, this is not best practice. This is suboptimal or just that's really stupid. You know, you need to get up, move around, get outside, have some fresh air, you know. And this is Scotland. You might not believe it with the sunshine coming in through the, the window. But, um, yeah, you, you've got to switch off at some point um, because it, it's just everything in moderation. You know, so it's an issue yeah. that I think we have to be proactive about. Yeah, and I think that's a, that's a really good point, getting the balance right. I think, you know, Mike made some great points about the sort of health well-being, fitness, that those, as you see more role models as a player, whether you're casual or you're a wannabe pro, you, you, you've got to start to understand that it's not just screen time and playing the games, it's everything else that goes with it and it's having that balance. And I think that's a great opportunity. Um, the, um, the, oh, image, the image of like... Uh, the image of the unfit gamer, I think, is, is one of the past. And actually, if you look at a lot of esports players now, they're often, um, you know, <laughs> pretty shredded. They have like diet plans, yeah, you know, routines. They do fitness workouts. So, you know, that I think people are realizing the benefits as well of being in peak physical condition in order to be the best players. Which is probably why I've struggled yeah. for so long. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, you're just on there, Mike, because I think for what it's worth, <laughs> as, as as profiles get bigger, you know, personas get bigger. There's going to be much more realization that, that you know not only that that the stars are real role models, but in order to sustain that that, that level of um, ability and competitiveness, you've got to do more than just be playing games. You've got to take care of your body, to take care of your mind, yeah. 
and get a balance. Um, well, look, that's brilliant, guys. Thanks so much for your time. Um, amazing. And, um, yeah, just, just massive thank yous to both of you for uh, putting so much time into this. Appreciate it.